Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Lara May, a clinical pharmacist specializing in functional medicine, as well as a certified yoga teacher and Reiki master. I run a truly integrative health coaching practice, encompassing functional medicine lab testing, yoga and meditation, and a sprinkling of Reiki energy medicine. Join me here on Light Body Radio to break through your health plateau and come into alignment with your natural vitality. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Light Body Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Lara May, and today I want to talk to you about lectins. And some of you may have heard about this book called The Plant Paradox. And it's become pretty controversial in the um, health and wellness field. Some people think it's way over the top. Other people think it's totally self-contradictory. And um, of course, some people in Western medicine are calling it a total farce. But what I think is important are um, is what he talks about with the dietary lectins. So the plant paradox is a book that promotes a certain style of eating like many diet books do. However, Dr. Stephen Gundry's premise of his book is that we you have these dietary lectins that cause a large amount of inflammation in the human body when they are eaten in excess which triggers which can trigger he says auto, autoimmune disease so i just wanted to go over what i feel like were the interesting parts and what i feel like um were some good takeaways and um then talk about the some of the food groups that we might want to be more aware of so but first let's talk about what are lectins lectins are a type Type of protein found in almost every living thing. They serve multiple multiple functions. The most relevant theory may be that they um, protect a plant from predators. And in the plant paradox, that predator is us as humans. Lectins have demonstrated that they are capable of something called molecular mimicry, meaning they can mimic other molecules. And this is a term for when a sequence of peptides in a dietary lectin mimics those uh, in the hum- in, uh, human molecules, thereby causing the immune system to cross-react, which he says triggers autoimmune disease. So which lectins are capable of inciting our body to attack itself? Unfortunately, that will take really research, decades of research, and lots of different types of studies to really um, flesh out But Dr. Gundry says um, his theory is um, who are already, he is already treating these patients for disease by uh, prescribing this diet that he supports, um, eliminates the biggest culprits. And that's what he's calling the plant paradox. So he says that um, we should avoid eating in excess legumes peas, sugar snap peas, green beans, chickpeas, soy, tofu, edamame, soy protein, beans, bean sprouts, lentils, and potatoes. And then also certain fruits and certain nuts. So you should also, he, according to him, be avoiding pumpkin, sunflower, chia, peanuts, and cashews, which is interesting. Because I, for one, love chia seeds. I think they're a great source of a um, complete plant protein. Some of the fruits he says that we should avoid, especially if they are not in season, are cucumbers, zucchini, pumpkins, squash, melons, eggplant, tomatoes, bell peppers, chili peppers, and goji berries. Now, um, some of the fruits I listed there were nightshade vegetables, and they are known to cause an immune response. Um, an inflammatory response, but others like the goji berries are considered in some circles to be a superfood, which means they are packed with enormous amounts of vitamin C and they're super concentrated in antioxidants. So that one is an interesting to me. More specifically, 
Lectins are sugar binding plant proteins that attach to our cell membranes. They form, they are a form of protein found in all kinds of plants and animal foods, which some consider to be a low level toxin. Lectins provide a built in defense mechanism that triggers a negative reaction in predators, aiding in the plant survival. There are countless varieties of lectins in nature. Plants evolved to produce these in their own self-defense. They actually have no interest in being a food source for you, if you can believe it, which is interesting if you think about the whole concept of being a vegan, but I won't go into that. Since they are not good at running away, plants had to develop some sort of defense mechanism. So they develop these natural pesticides, these repellents, these, these protective mechanisms for themselves. Lectins are abundant in things like raw legumes and grains, and most commonly found in the part of the seed that becomes the leaf when the plant sprouts. They are found also in dairy products, and like I already said, vegetables. So how do these lectins actually cause harm to us? Because they resist digestion, lectins act as so-called anti-nutrients, which means they have a detrimental effect on your gut microbiome by shifting the balance of your bacterial flora. One of the worst culprits is wheat germ agglutinin, or um, also called WGA. And this is found in wheat and other seeds in the grass family. So if you are already suffering from some sort of digestive issue, whether it's uh, regurge, GERD, heartburn, gas, bloating, especially after you eat certain foods like wheat or beans, then this is something you should definitely pay attention to because you don't want to start, you don't want to be causing more harm than good or irritating um, a condition that already exists for you that maybe you're trying to heal. So... Dr. Gundry suggests that some plants can contribute to leaky gut by binding to receptors on your intestinal cells and your intestinal cell walls, therefore interfering in the absorption of nutrients across your intestinal wall. So compared to WGA, gluten is actually a minor problem, so says Dr. Gundry. And that's because WGA has been shown to be one of the most efficient ways to induce heart disease in experimental animals. Due to their negative autoimmune and inflammatory effects, lectins are particularly toxic to anyone dealing with an autoimmune disorder already. If this is you, you may want to consider eliminating lectins or drastically reducing your intake. One manner in which lectins stir up trouble in your body is through molecular mimicry, like I already mentioned. So um, by mimicking proteins in your thyroid, for example, uh, or joint spaces, lectins can trick your body into to attacking your thyroid gland and contributing to things like rheumatoid arthritis. Part of this disease process results in lectins and lipopolysaccharides penetrating your gut wall, causing a strong immune response. So again, if you're struggling with inflammatory or autoimmune conditions, you may be among those who need to be very careful with respect to those lectin containing foods, specifically beans, legumes, grains, and nightshades. But are all lectins bad for you? Absolutely not. While Dr. Gundry declares lectins are, quote, the greatest danger in the American diet, especially for those with autoimmune, the truth is, is that some lectins in small amounts can provide valuable health benefits. Lectins are thought to play a role in immune function, cell growth, cell death, and body fat regulation. It seems most problems arise from the overconsumption or continued consumption, even in small amounts, if your body simply can't tolerate them. So it would be a big mistake to assume that all lectins are bad, in my personal opinion. One of my favorite foods, actually, um, tomatoes, I'll now say two of my favorite foods, tomatoes and avocados both contain the lectin, um, and I'm going to struggle how to pronounce this, agglutinin. I think I actually did a good job. <laughs> agglutinin. But I continue to eat them because I love them. Avocados are a fantastic source of healthy fats. They're great for your brain. So, um, 
Some healthy foods do contain things that by Dr. Gundry's standards should be avoided. So this is definitely, uh, I think, comes down to personal preference and personal health. And so you have to be aware of maybe some of these triggers if you're, like I said, struggling with a inflammatory issue or an auto autoimmune disease. But um, if you're someone that is on the path to healing, and you've noticed that now maybe you're not as sensitive as you once were, then I think in small amounts, some of these foods could still be okay. Again, tomatoes, they're part of the nightshade family, and they are often listed among among the most problematic lectin-containing food. But the heat of cooking them brings about some positive benefits. The antioxidant lycopene in tomatoes has enhanced bioavailability when you heat it, making tomatoes healthy in other ways. Bean lectins, however, are accompanied by a more potentially toxic or allergenic effect. And beyond their lectin content, beans are also high in net carbs. So for this reason, they are best avoided in the initial transitional stages of things like the ketogenic diet. Or if you're a diabetic, then it's probably best to avoid them because they are such a high carbohydrate factor. As you can see, the choices for these against lectin hinges on the particular food in question and the effects the lectins have on the individual eater the individual person. While a good deal of controversy has been stirred up by this book, which I think is always good because controversy spurs discussion and discussion spurs critical thinking. So I think it's a great. However, like I said, I think these things need to be taken into um, each individual's personal health issues and eating preferences but I will go over the most damaging lectins to avoid. And a lot of these are foods that I already talk about avoiding because we know that um, they are inflammatory and damaging. Number one being grains and legumes. And as much as I love black beans, um, black beans are high in lectins, kidney beans are high in lectins, lentils, lima beans, soybeans, they are all high, they have high amounts of lectins in them. Also um, included in this list are dairy products, especially those originating from grain-fed animals. So if you are um, struggling with autoimmune, stay away from that. Legumes, again, which are all beans, peanuts, and soy. Nightshade vegetables, which include eggplant, potatoes, peppers, and tomatoes. And wheat and other seeds of the grass family, such as barley, buckwheat, corn, millet, oats, and rye. Most lectins are pro-inflammatory, meaning they trigger inflammation. They create advanced glycation in products. C-reactive protein is one example of the many lectins that you have circulating in your body right now. And it's actually used as a marker of inflammation. We can do a blood test to test your C-reactive protein levels. And if it's high, then we know that your body is fighting something and is therefore mounted an inflammatory response. Lectins are also immunotoxic, which means they're capable of stimulating a hyperimmune response. They are also considered neurotoxic and cytotoxic, meaning they are toxic to your nerves and your cell cells and may include apoptosis, which is cell death. Certain lectins can increase your blood viscosity by binding to your red blood cells. This makes your red blood cells sticky, resulting in abnorm abnormal clotting. Some lectins also, such as the WGA I mentioned, have been known to interfere with gene expression and disrupt your endocrine function. Equally worrisome is the reality that lectins promote leptin resistance, thereby increasing your risk of obesity because leptin is that, um, that protein that switches on and off your um, hunger feelings or your sati feeling full, I should say. So all of these factors can predispose you to inflammation and disease. If you have any kind of health problem in which lectins are the suspected contributor, you again should consider eliminating them from your diet entirely, at least until you heal. So besides total elimination, are there some other ways that you can um, reduce your lectin exposure? Absolutely. 
So after eliminating your worst offenders, then you can further reduce the lectins with um, a few of the following things I'm going to go over. So the first is peel and de-seed your fruits and vegetables. The skin or the hull of the seeds tend to contain the highest amount of lectins. For example, if you will want to remove the seeds from peppers and tomatoes prior to eating them. Another way to reduce your lectin content is to sprout your beans, grains, and seeds before you eat them. Sprouting deactivates the lectins, and then, but of course, there's always some exceptions. So do not sprout your legumes, but the lectin content is actually enhanced when sprouting alfalfa. Also, you can eat fermented foods. Fermentation effectively reduces the harmful lectins and all sorts of vegetables can be fermented, thereby boosting their health benefits. Fermentation also boosts the amount of good bacteria that you're introducing into your stomach and it actually helps support and replenish your microbiome. So definitely um, feel free to eat plenty of fermented foods. You can also use a pressure cooker. The best way to neutralize lectins when cooking is by using a pressure cooker. Dr. Gundry says, if you're cooking with beans, tomatoes, potatoes, and quinoa, the pressure cooker is your best bet. But it still won't even touch the lectins in wheat, oats, rye, barley, or spelt. So avoid, um, avoid those still. And avoid slow cookers since by low cooking temperatures, that is insufficient to remove lectins. So you want to use a pressure cooker. If you choose to still eat beans, it's imperative that you prepare and cook them properly, mainly because eating raw or undercooked beans can have toxic effects for you. Um, the USDA actually states that eating as few as four or five raw beans may cause phytohemagglutinin toxicity, which is often marked by extreme nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. The FDA, the FDA notes several incidents of poisoning with, with respect to undercooking of beans every year. So how do you safely prepare your beans? First of all, you want to soak them in water for at least 12 hours before cooking them, changing the water frequently and rinsing them. You can also add baking soda to the wa soaking water, which will further neutralize the lectins. Make sure you discard the soaking water and rinse the beans and then cook at least cook them for at least 15 minutes on high, or again, use a pressure cooker. Many people swear by the Instapot, so you might wanna try that out. I have not personally tried that, but I have a pressure cooker that um, on the rare occasion I make beans that I use, and I also soak them for a long time before I cook them as well, and it does help, I have noticed. Given the extensive list of lectin-containing foods, it would be nearly impossible to eliminate them entirely from your diet. And again, you'd probably be missing out on some important nutrients if you did that as well. So many lectin-containing vegetables also contain polyphenols, which are micronutrients with antioxidants that play an important role in preventing and reducing the progression of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and neurogenitive conditions. Polyphenols are also regarded as a prebiotic, increasing the ratio of beneficial bacteria in your gut, which is important for disease prevention and weight management. So again, if you're sensitive to the um, inflammatory process of lectins, then definitely decrease them and cook them appropriately and prepare them appropriately to further decrease your exposure. But I would definitely caution against um, eliminating them completely because they do have some positive effects on the body as well. So I hope this episode today was informative and um, maybe shed some light on a fairly recent issue that's emerged in the health and wellness world. And if you have any questions, please reach out and let me know. And I'd be curious to know if some of you have found that you are sensitive to lectins or not, or if you just think this is a whole bunch of BS. Either way, I am interested to hear your feedback and your own personal experiences. And I will um, catch you on the flip side. Definitely check me out on Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Lara May. That's D-R-L-A-R-A-M-A-Y. 
and I'm also on Twitter and YouTube, and you can find this podcast on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, and Podbeam. So I hope you have a fantastic day, and I'll catch you in a couple weeks.